Boom, what's good, happening, everybody? It's your boy, Ferris Madonna, and welcome to another edition of LGRN Reviews. On this special episode, we are inter- interviewing, we are reviewing, wow. we are reviewing episodes one and two of season two of Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. I, I, thought, I forgot the subtitle, I forgot the subtitle for a minute. Sure. But it is a new season. You guys already watched our uh, season one recap, if you want to call it a recap, sure. If you want to yeah. call it just two dudes talking basketball, you can also call that as well. Yeah. But the dude I'm talking basketball with is none other than my main man from up north. It is the greatest import Canada has ever done besides Ooh. maple syrup. Wow. That's Sorry. a lot. That's a lot to live up to. We are the north up here. Uh, I, I tell you. Uh, yeah. That basketball. Yeah. The recap episode. There was recap this. There was just a lot to recap. <laughs> Right, well. Like there was ten episodes, so mm-hmm. yeah. When you start talking a basketball show, you're gonna start talking basketball. It's just more yeah. fun. All right, there well, might be more of that this week. Who knows? Probably, probably. Mm-hmm. But you know, but we are doing one and two. Um, after one, yeah. after this episode is gonna be more episodic. We're gonna do just episode by episode. Yeah. Uh, but let's get right into it, Rob. Episode one starts with a flash forward. Yeah. It was not. It's it, they flash forward to 1984, the first time ever. The Lakers, led by Magic Johnson, and the Boston Celtics, led by Larry Bird, faced each other in the NBA Finals. Their first time, uh, Magic just he beats Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics on their home court, uh, and they are running out of Boston Garden because Boston Garden is a hellscape. Back in the eighties, it was a, it was a, it was the place to be if you want beer thrown at you and be, and, and if you're a black man getting called racial slurs, definitely got to go there. It's like the epicenter of racism. Yes. Yeah, it was terrible. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but hate. yep. So, Rob, your initial thoughts on episode. Let's do let's do initial thoughts on both episodes. We'll start with episode one. Your initial thoughts on episode one. Uh it was a it was a good episode. Now, I'm gonna say, uh, for the first two episodes at least, it has a bit of a different feel than the first season. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I don't know if it's because it's going off of uh, it, it doesn't have the same kind of source material. Of course, it, it has. Well, I guess it has the same source material. Yes, it has a hist- historic events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think does the book actually go in through to like the 1984? Uh, uh, I have to reread it. I, I don't. I don't, so. I don't know. I don't know I everything. I have to reread it. Yeah, I have to reread it. There it just seems something is a little bit different. Still enjoyable and stuff like that. Uh, um, yeah, I, I would say that it's hard to say who's a hero so far in the story. Maybe Jeannie Buss. Now, I wouldn't consider Magic Johnson the hero of this story yet. Um, I, Norm Nixon. Oh, <laughs> well, we'll talk about episode two. We'll talk about episode yeah, two. We'll talk about episode two. Yeah, uh, I, I love Norm Nixon as a character. Like this is, yeah, I think I think. Like, it's I, like a I always say, character. character like I always say, he's a real person. <laughs> he's a real. Person. He's a real person, but it, it is a fictionalized. Uh, like they're they're not going. This isn't a documentary. This is yeah. a this is a um, scripted show. But before we get more into that, Rob, I, I keep forgetting. Oh boy, guys, this video was filmed during the 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. Without the labor of the writers and actors currently on strike, this series would being covered here wouldn't exist. So I want everyone to remember that, guys. The reason this show exists, the reason we like it, the reason we're talking about it, is that we had a couple, we had hardworking people in that writing writers room and the actors on on like you know we, Norm Nixon's a great character, Devon Nixon who plays him, by the way, is his son actually, but he's an actor and he brings a, a lot of good layers to Norm. Um, last season. Wood Harris with Spencer Haywood. Remember, actors and writers are are the the important key cogs in the machine of this art. So that's all I gotta say. Yeah. Continue, Rob. Uh, yeah, and they and they're all fantastic. There is nothing mm-hmm. like uh, to say that the uh, the actual characters, the actual acting is uh, maybe better this year. Um, I just think that the the it feels the story is a little bit weaker, but who knows. Uh, Things dropping in, like uh, talking about ESPN, like it's Jerry Bus, who's the guy who's spearheading the uh, ESPN thing, like that. Not sure if that's true or not. I think they uh, they added it in there really quick. Um, but I'm gonna say, let's go back. I'm gonna go talk about the show. Now they they get on the bus, they run for their lives. 
yep. to get out of to get out of Boston Gardens. And then they just stick around there and have an inspirational speech by Pat Riley. Like, wouldn't you couldn't you do that with the bus driving? Like, why'd you wait? Why why were you in such a hurry to get to the bus just so you can get things like they're like I would have felt safer in the building where they couldn't break the glass at me than I would in the bus just sitting there. Well, I think they ran so fast to the bus they had time. <laughs> they well, they time. didn't have time. They got attacked. They got attacked. Yeah, because you know, because the, the speech was a little too long. It was a little long. But they they could have they could have they could have made it out if you know Jerry uh, you know Pat Riley. Yeah. What sneaky, did you think? Sneaky. What did you think of that that speech? We want their hearts. I liked it actually. I got it. I was like, yeah, take their heart, man. Take yeah. their heart. You're a... But knowing yeah. how knowing how 1984 ended, it's gonna be hilarious to watch. <laughs> Sorry, I won't spoil history. Yeah, don't tell. <laughs> uh, then we go into the uh, into the theme, and they redo the theme. They make it a little more 80s ish. It looks like it's a little more on video cassette now. They also extended the theme a little bit, a lot more of the actual song to it. Yeah, um, they, 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 I, lo- I, think I the- loved it. I think this is like the back stanchion of the song. Yeah. It's like towards the towards the towards the end of the song, I think. You know, my favorite mutiny by Boots Riley and the coup. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, from uh, from the great city of Oakland in the oh, Bay right. Area. So shout out to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Bay Area res, res, uh, Bay Area, you know, resident and uh and all around uh phenomenal person <laughs> right here. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Well, all right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you said nice things about me. I won't disagree. I won't disagree for the fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I really loved what they did with the uh, the song. The song was already great, and I think they just no, uh, it's phenomenal. I think they just did so much more with it. Okay, uh, we get out of the credits, and it's now the business of Magic Johnson. They're showing in full force, and this man, uh, despite uh, turning down uh, Nike, which is of course maybe the worst business decision anyone else has ever made in their entire lives besides michael jordan yeah yeah. uh we uh show him he's uh selling stuff like seven up now he's got uh converse obviously general motors is um backing or being uh uh sold by magic johnson he is now uh, a pitch man uh this is a quite early for athletes to be uh this uh to be this much for it uh, there was always the weird thing like uh joe namath and his jockey shorts and i think pete rose did it too but it was uh, it was always kind of uh uh based on one sort of thing he i think he went really broad and i think that something that you'll see about magic johnson uh going on if i don't know how long the show is going to go for but even to today just how smart he was a he was a keen businessman, and he knew how well, to make money. Also, too, in the eighties, um, the eighties, man, it brought everything was bigger. Everything was, you know, bolder. You know, like like I, I remember, like in this time period, uh, you know, Seven Up's two pitchmen were Ray, Sugar Ray Leonard and Magic Johnson, mm-hmm. and they they're both similar. They're both similar, uh, and they're both prominent black athletes, great smiles, um, friendly to white America. Yeah, and they loved him, right? And and they they were big fans of them, so that so it made sense because in the eighties, a lot of commercialization, a lot of consumerism, buy buy buy, and Magic Johnson just fit the eighties, but but oh, yeah. but but the commercialism and the fantasy was quickly drawn out, Rob, because when we see the billboard of Seven Up Magic Johnson, they go right into a conversation with his lawyer and his business manager talking about how that man fathered a child. With yeah. his, with his, the love of his life's best friend Rhonda, and he's denying that it's not his, but Rhonda's saying it is yours, and the lawyer and the business manager, Doctor Day, are saying we'll just pay her off, and when nothing's go- and everything will be all right. Yes. And that creates an internal conflict. Do you did you like that they 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 shouted that internal conflict when he was like he he's if 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 he says it's not his his child, he doesn't have to be the father. But if he knows for a fact it's his child, he wants to be the father. But this business partner is saying we, we can't do that. Yeah. So I, I think it showed. Like I think it showed uh, a lot about how he could be. Uh, a, I would. I wouldn't say controlled. Maybe manipulated. He could be manipulated by uh, by uh, uh, his agent there, by the lawyer. I think the lawyer uses her uh, her wiles in other ways. We'll see uh, very uh, very soon or whatever as well. They all help uh, control uh, the way magic's thinking. And uh, 
I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a poor choice that he makes. Um, but, uh, we'll see what happens at the end of the end of the episode. Maybe, uh, maybe things will turn around and maybe things will happen so that, uh, magic, uh, could change his mind and stuff like that. But, you know, we still have 50 minutes to go in this show, an extra long opening episode of the season. So yeah, uh, proposing to buy her silence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, and then and then we kind of dovetail into a into a scene when they're at the draft and the owners are talking about the draft and Red Arbeck just casually talks about how he drafted okay. Kevin McHale and traded for Robert Parrish. And Dr. Buss is like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Who cares? Why, yeah. He, yeah. Lakers was only a second round pick that yes. year. Uh, so yeah, so they trade the, the the Celtics end up getting the number one pick because somehow uh, because of the free agent rules or what I think they signed Bob McAdoo. Think so. And, and uh, to uh, send him back to Detroit, uh, they were he, they were given the first uh, overall pick and their thirteenth overall pick. They send them to Golden State for Larry, for Robert Parrish. Mm -hmm. uh, an absolute stud in the set, as center, and then Kevin McHale in that front court of the. It's the, the greatest Celtics. front court of all time. Unbelievable. The greatest front court of all time. Those two draft picks turned out to be Joe Barry Carroll and Ricky Brown. So, uh, and Boston obviously won. Boston yeah, won in the end. Boston won the trade. Boston won the trade. Uh, yeah. So, and obviously, nothing good is ever going to happen to the Golden State Warriors ever since. Yes. Yeah. Besides drafting the, the player that completely revolutionized the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then the next, okay, so that's it for dinner. He's giving him shit or whatever. The logo's there. He's angry about everything. Still, he's always angry. Uh, always angry. Yeah, more great work for Jason Clark. It's either angry or sad. It's one of the one or the other. They go to the they go to the hotel uh, where uh, they always are for spring spring uh, train or for training camp, and. <laughs> Paul Westhead uh, talks to Pat Riley about a new product called Moose. We'll see how that. <laughs> you know what's funny about him talking to Pat Riley about Moose? Mm -hmm. Pat Riley becomes the king of Moose. Absolutely, he becomes the king. So, like, this is the I, the seed that goes into Pat Riley's head. It's like moosing, mm -hmm. not just having this wavy kind of early 70s hair that i've been rocking all right you see it a little bit in the flashback or whatever i don't think they did i don't think they did the hair quite justice yet no not yet not yet yeah, no it's gonna be tough and it, it needs more to it needs more it. it needs more fluff it needs more fluff it looks it looks too it looks too late they should have just mm -hmm. had him on staff they should just be paying power no 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 this is how you do the hair they could probably make the same probably have the same product he's probably been using the same product his entire career mm -hmm. uh so anyways and then we see magic coming in some of the players and it looks like Magic, even though he's only uh, on a sophomore season, mm -hmm. thinks he should be running the LA Lakers. And they have a guy who's considered by many, maybe the best basketball player of all time. I wouldn't. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is still on that team. He's still the captain of that team. Man is, the man has wanted every single level of basketball. They've had to change rules because of this man. Yeah. There's a reason why he's. And then and then and then when he they changed the rule, he changed he changed it up and beat their rule. Yeah, the sky hook. He just yeah. he just went from un, one unstoppable shot to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the smartest basketball player. Maybe that's maybe that's the best way to put him. Yeah. Maybe he's the smartest basketball player there ever been. Uh, tough, so big. Uh, yeah, uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Uh, I wish they would just do more about him, just like a, just essentially saying about him. Maybe go from when he was Lou Alcindor until when he goes to. Uh, yeah, we got a lot about. We got a little bit in the first in the first episode of him converting and him him his dad. I didn't know his dad was a cop. No, I didn't know that. You know, I didn't know that. So there is there is that that kind of, but I knew about the conversion and his um, self doubt. That was pretty nice. But me, go ahead. But no, Rob, I, I don't want to go, you know, I don't want to go little by little. You know, we don't want to be here all, we'll be here all night if we talk about little by little. Yeah, no, Let's talk good. about the main, the main themes of episode one was Magic Johnson not blows out his knee, strains his knee, probably tears a, a piece, a part of his knee. He, and, uh, uh, yeah, he tore cartilage in his knee. Yeah. He, so 
and then you know it's you know he he's uh he's talking to his knee at one moment that I, what like that artistic decision of having inanimate objects speak to him like Larry Bird in the in the in the uh in the newspaper starts talking to him and he's just tripping what do you what, what do you think about that it seems, yeah it seems like they always need a narrator to go for what's going on in uh, uh as ad- adversaries inside of magic's head and stuff mm-hmm. like that so um i think as a as a plot device it works well i i really enjoyed when the uh uh the the lipstick started talking i thought uh maybe the maybe the voice didn't match the uh the animation just with the red lipstick and all uh, with that deep, deep voice, but uh, yeah, I thought it, I thought it was a lot of fun. But still, it's 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 a TV show. Like I like I'm not here just for a dr- a dramatic uh, re uh, reimagining of what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, it it should be a little bit fun. And uh, yeah, it was it was fun. But they yeah, so they show the touring like the cartilage on the knee. That's one thing. I say the more iconic injury is showing how cream scratches his cornea. I was about I was about to talk about that rabbi. I realized I skipped over. How do you like them showing the conflict between Magic and Kareem, the physical conflict and Kareem basically saying, "You know what? I'll run with the I'll run with the twos and I'm going to whoop your ass." And, yeah. they, and they and they go to battle and then you you see the scratch retina. Yeah, it's uh yeah, that's a it's fantastic. You, you, I think and it's what drives the Lakers, right? There's that inner conflict between the two. They work, they can work so well together, but they are completely opposite people, completely opposite players. Mm-hmm. Uh, like uh, uh, magic is so much about imagination and spontaneity. And Kareem is so much about uh, being in the same spot, playing the same drive because he's unstoppable. He knows what he can do. And he's unstoppable, but uh, you can always double team a cream. You could triple team, mm-hmm. and then that's when you need the creativity of a magic. And what it, guys, it turns out it works all right. But yeah, uh, when he scratches his cornea, that's when he starts going to the glasses and the goggles. Mm-hmm. Now this is where I remember Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I only remember him playing with the goggles and the glasses. I was seven years old when this happened, so. Yeah, this is so for me. When as soon as I saw the glasses come on, I got pretty psyched. I was like, "Yes, finally, I get to see it!" Like now, I get to see my cream. Now I'm just waiting for the hair to go. Mm-hmm. So uh, another next. another big theme of the show, besides the magic injury, is Magic's injury and his conflict with his family about Rhonda and the child. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the next two topics are going to be about family. So first is the Johnson family. So him and his dad and his mom kind of creating a united front in front of Rhonda's dad. But then when Rhonda's dad leaves, they basically cuss out magic. They cuss magic out yep. and say, how, how stupid you, how you're an idiot. How dumb are you? And then, you know, and then another aspect of the family is how maybe a little nicer than that. Maybe a little nicer than that, but yeah, but, but stern, they, they, stern yeah. like they should be like, yeah, yeah. But then another, another piece of the family is Dr. Buss wanting to integrate his three older children into his yeah. life because he feels like he, he he didn't see them grow up. He wasn't in their life like that. So he wants to make up for lost time. I think he's and also worried could, that yeah. that he's becoming more like his dad. His dad wasn't around. Yes. And because of this, he, unfortunately, he also doesn't know what it's like to have a father around. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think he takes out a lot of uh, frustration out on his kids. Um, not genie. I think, uh, well, genie, uh, uh, is a, is a, you know, was always like the, like daddy's girl, but so business smart, just so, so with it, the other two goes you know, back to what Claire said in season one, where she says, Claire, I want to be like you. And Claire says, no, yeah, you're going to be like him. And then, yeah. you know, that, that famous phrase for him. Yeah. Hey man, I'll say, man, they, they make Jim Buss seem like a dipshit. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, uh, seem like, seem like. Yeah, they made him an ass. They made him an <laughs> ass. They made him an ass. <laughs> and they made us. They made. They made Johnny seem like. So Rob, let's you know. Let's talk about. Let's talk about the monopoly scene. I want. Then we'll talk yeah. about it. Where it's hard to where, watch. Where, where, where yeah, where Doctor Bus is saying like, "What are you doing, Johnny? Yeah. Take him out. Take the him killer, out. The killer instinct. Yeah, he, he basically says killer instinct. You yeah. don't have one. And he starts. He starts cussing out his sons. Basically, called him a bunch of pansies. He's like, y'all some yep. pansies, you yep. know what I mean? Like, like y'all are y'all are y'all scaredy cats. Y'all are losers. Y'all not you guys are not men. Basically, he basically called them. And then Jim yeah. says, "Well, you, you." And then Jim says, "You know what? You're gonna leave us again to go 
you know, with your with your with your floozies and your and your and your and your politely put, politely, politely put. Yeah, politely yeah. put. And then he says, You you have no right to judge me. Right. And he's mm-hmm. talking, and then and then you know, he genie's just like, Come on, guys, let's play, guys. Come on. And he like just completely destroys the game, kind of emasculates Johnny and pisses off Jim. And Janie's just annoyed. Rob, your thoughts on that scene? Difficult to watch. And I think that that whole thing is about, like, this man does not know how to parent. Um, He is, it's it's a characterization of people that I have seen before in my life, Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I have witnessed uh, arguments like this. Uh, no, because not from my dad, <laughs> thankfully. But uh, I've I've witnessed other people talk like this with their kids, uh, and it's a uh, it's difficult, it's troubling, it's a uh, it's a uh, no wonder if this is the way those kids have been treated their entire lives that they act like that. Uh, you feel bad for them, um, you know. I don't feel you know I don't find them bad for them, but you know that you still feel bad for those guys, and they were and they were they were given everything, they were given gymnastics teams what the hell indoor soccer teams the Go los t- angeles lasers tennis teams there was tennis teams in the 80s i didn't know that it was bizarre uh <laughs> so yeah so yeah he, he thinks they're ungrateful he thinks they're lazy because he did all this work i think uh you know he, you know his wife is much different than his Joanne? mom yeah his wife raised these kids much differently than uh, Mrs. Bus raised uh, Jerry, so mm-hmm. I think there's always there, it's just going to be hard, and they never spent very much time together. I don't think these people actually know each other very much. Um, so yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing when you have us when 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 somebody in the family becomes so successful, and these and they're still young kids. Like at, at this time, Jeannie is 19 years old. Mm-hmm. So the boys can't be much older. 20, 20, 21. Yeah, 21, 22 years old. So yeah, they don't even show like the youngest daughter ever in the show. It's like she never Jenny. existed. Yeah. So uh yeah, so they're still kids, you know, they've been given things. Sure, maybe coddled a little bit, but uh that's his own fault. All of this, all of this is his fault. And I think he takes it out on uh I think he takes it out on people that uh, really don't deserve it so Mm -hmm. Uh, a difficult scene um i'm not sure like i'm really not well obviously uh the buses still uh stay in the family business for a while so we'll see we'll see how the how this leads up uh later on in this series and stuff like that yeah uh, you know fun fact about a difficult scene to watch fun fact about lakers ownership rob Mm -hmm. you want to know who owns 27 percent of the lakers who's that todd bowley Yep, Todd Bowley, the chairman and operator and perpetrator of Chelsea FC. Good man. He's you know, a good, they should have a they should have a Todd Bowley show. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Rob, now let's talk about the second aspect of family. I think this kind of rounds out episode one, and then we can move on to episode two. Good. The Johnson family and how right. they're, you know, like they're they gotta create this united front with their with their son, even though in their back of their mind they're like they think their son is a massive moron and like how dare he try to buy off this child. And there's that famous, ep- there's that, there's that moment where Rhonda's dad, Mr. Mitchell confronts magic and how magic is just sitting in the living room, looking away from the table. And Mr. Mm-hmm. Mitchell's like, look at me. And it is kind of an issue. And then Mr. Johnson has to get in between them and says, Hey man, you better watch. You better not talk to my son like that. But in the back of his mom, he's like, you know what? Mr. Easy Mitchell, brother. Easy hey, brother. He's telling him to calm down, but he kind of agrees with him a little. Mm-hmm. Kind of agrees with him, and then what do you guys? What do you think about the Johnson dynamic? How how they're playing it in the show? I think it's a different looking Johnson dynamic, especially uh, well, not from Mister Johnson, but uh, from Mrs. Johnson. Um, I think that uh, they put up a united front on this one, and I think they've just had enough. They want to see more of the the values that they have raised Magic to be in. Um, and I think the the celebrity of being Magic Johnson got to him, and he forgot to be Irvin Johnson. But uh, I love the way I love the way they end up dealing with this at the end of the episode. We also should mention that uh, Cookie's uh, role in this, and he's still calling Cookie mm-hmm. all the time. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Cookies with a new boyfriend and stuff like that. But these two are going to be together like they're like they're honestly soulmates. And I think that's how they're going to portray it in the show. Of course, Irvin, not always a good man, but uh, uh, I think he, he does love always love Cookie in his way and stuff like that. But she is his conscience, I think, as well. So she's always, I think, able to talk to him, get through to him. But uh, um, I think when we were talking before, MVPs of episodes and this has to go to uh uh father johnson yes uh and an unbelievable performance especially how he asks uh uh, his agent to uh kindly get off his porch yeah Uh, and maybe not so uh kind words i love how he uses the agent's word he's like oh yeah man a great a great man was told my son my son something my son should never deliver bad Mm -hmm. news well, get the hell off my porch. You know what yeah. I mean? And and Mr. Day, you know, and and I love Day, I love I love when his mom comes in and says, Who was a motherfucker? Yeah. I love it. I love, I love it. that. And he's like, Mom. It's like, <laughs> what? Yeah, my my like no, it's it's just the condescension in, in Mr. Day's voice is like, Oh, Mr. Johnson, I didn't know it was a garbage holiday. Like, yeah, like bro, what like yo man, like yeah, yeah, people like Garbage people are one of the most important people in society, period. Yeah, sure. They are one of the most important people in society, period. Not a job I want. Not a job no one wants. But mm-hmm. it has to be done. And, and the people who choose to do it, do it. They get And they deserve all the money they get. They get paid good. And they deserve every cent. Yeah. Every cent. It's like delivery people. You know how like so many packages are not being delivered? Everyone's always, it's online shopping, packaging, packaging. Packet, package delivery people. And garbage people are some of those important people in society. People they make society run. They are important, and just like Mister Doctor Day, just being condescending to Mister Johnson. I have more respect for Mister Johnson's job than Doctor than Doctor Day's job. Even I don't even care his name is Doctor. I don't. What is he a doctor in? We don't know. He could be a doctor of nothing. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like it could be. You know, like so. Miss me with your nonsense. You know. Mr. Johnson as a garbage man has more respect to me than than whatever. Also, too, Rob, before we round out um episode uh episode one, um, it was the birth of the system. Yes. Paul Westhead's system. Uh, and for basketball lovers and lures, they know about the system. The system is about run and gun. It, it was the early version of Mike D'Antoni's seven seconds or less. It was the system. It was you run the spots and you shoot, you shoot, you shoot, you shoot, you shoot, and you shoot. Ball doesn't touch the floor. Ball doesn't touch the floor. Yeah. That's the ball doesn't touch the floor. He took it to Denver. Uh um, damn it, I don't want to didn't I just spoil? I think I just spoiled something. No, I didn't. Yeah. I uh, hate uh, the system. No. Yeah. The system is everything. And and they're thriving. Norm Nixon is thriving in the system. Everyone's yep. thriving in the system. You know, when you took out when you took out Magic Johnson from the team, the team was thriving. When you took out Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the team was thriving in the early parts, you know. And then when they're both together, yeah, you, he you says kinda... it. He says it in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Teams will always beat stars. Yeah. So you have to play as a team. Move the ball. Move the ball. Get to your spots. This is where you shoot best. This is high percentage mm-hmm. basketball. You get the ball there as fast as you can. You take your shot, and just keep shooting. Just shoot. Just shoot. Don't you know? Don't let a defense set up. Always keep them moving. Take your shot where you're comfortable at. If you get to your spots, that's it. As my fast favorite, as you can. My favorite thing is uh, is Jerry Jerry Buss's voiceover talking about the Adam. Yeah. And then when Magic Johnson shows up and everyone starts chanting Magic, he says, "But when you in, when you introduce when you drop in one new element, you can spark a chain reaction. Yeah. And Changes kaboom. Everything. And then when you when you hear him say kaboom." Norm Nixon gets the ball stolen from him. And yeah, that's when I he knew all, 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 it all went downhill after that. You know, a little dramatic license in that for sure. But uh, yes, and that's how the first episode ends with Magic is on his way back. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. that's, now, that's it. Now we're on to episode two. Episode two and Magic is back. And I Magic think is the, back. Yeah, I think the episode is called Ma- The Magic is Back. The, the Magic is Back. So the there you go. Back. He's back, uh, but it looks like the the Lakers or whatever so are uh, having a, a bit of trouble. Um, they're looking to make a big trade, and they're looking 
to get the Skywalker, David Thompson. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, David Thompson was a shooting guard. He is um, a NCAA champion. He was the Final Four MVP. Mm-hmm. He was a, f- a four-time All-Star. I believe he's in the Hall of Fame. He's a good player. Mm-hmm. What they don't say is he had a bit of a problem around this time. Uh, but he did uh, a lot of cocaine. Yeah, he, he I love cocaine guys. So mm. uh, yeah, so they allegedly, don't, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah we, yeah, we don't know that for sure. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, but yes, uh, but he plays. He's a shooting guard. He, he could play off the uh, on the other side of the court from mm-hmm. Magic. Um, it, it's it's for Norm Nixon, who's uh, been playing incredibly well and fits. Olesset's system, I think, better than even Magic does. Um, now, I, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit because we're talking about uh, Norm Nixon and Paul Westhead's system. Mm-hmm. And it comes down Norm to... Norm Nixon was like the original Bo Kimball. Mm-hmm. What they want to do is, is make that trade. Now, mm-hmm. somehow, even though he's in his first full year as a head coach... Paul West that has the veto, veto, power. veto power on traits. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I, that is that, that true? Seems, that, that 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 can't be true because that's if that does happen, that's pretty stupid. You look at all the first time coach veto power. You look at all the people they have in the in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you have veto power over Bill Sharman, Jerry West, and Doctor Bus. Yeah, that seems that seems a little much for a guy who took over as an interim coach. Yeah, from somebody else, uh, thirteen games into a season, mm-hmm. um, seems pretty remarkable. Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of dramatic license there. Yeah. Maybe, but I'm yeah. You know, I tried to look it up. I tried to look at this. Did Paul Westhead have veto power in his Lakers contract? I couldn't find anything, so who knows? Mm-hmm. But we're starting to see a bit of a separation now between Pat Riley and Paul Wesson. Well, before that, there's a separation between team and magic. Yep. That's true too. Mm-hmm. It's, well, he, magic lo- was gone for 100 days. Mm-hmm. He missed 45 games getting his knee scoped out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's over half a season that you're missing a guy. I guess he got injured in uh, November or something like that. So he's coming back. That'd uh, be three and a half months later. So we're getting towards the end of the season now. They had been on a roll there. Another thing, Magic getting injured. I, I want to, sorry, I'm going to jump all over the place here a little bit. Magic gets injured. Mm-hmm. And Jerry <clears throat> Butts goes on a tirade about not even making the playoffs. It's like, what? What? Like, Blue Jabal is going to take you to the playoffs. Yeah, you're going to make the playoffs. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you, don't worry about it. And then even still, when they were coming back or whatever, it's like, if we don't make this trade, we're not going to make the playoffs. Like, what? All right, whatever. I think, again, a little more a little more dramatic license and stuff like that. I don't think the Lakers were ever in that much trouble, considering yeah. the team that they play uh, was a sub-500 team. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, let's go back to uh, – do you want to talk about uh, – uh, Pat Riley and uh, Paul West in here quick. Oh yeah, you start to see the division and the machinations of of a usurper. Yeah. Um. It, it it's 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 really tremendous about uh you see him doing his his secret workout his secret workout um secret workouts with Magic. So when Magic was um diagnosed with H um when he was HIV positive, Magic he was coming back to play in the ninety two All Star game, mm-hmm. and he needed someone to work out with, and he called up. His buddy Pat Riley, who at that time in 1992 was the head coach of the New York Knicks, and he worked out with Pat Riley in New York to get him back in shape. Um, so you know they they talk about it in the, the the 30 for 30 the announcement, which was which was around Magic Johnson, uh, his AIDS announcement, which is actually the very first scene. This entire show was yeah. him at the hospital and then him driving to the the forum to make that announcement which was you know i'll always of, uh, remember that day my entire life i'll always yeah, remember that it was the day, it was the day it was day it was the day a disease changed mm-hmm. you know like it completely and changed the it, world's it, it's perception not, of it changed. the world's perception changed and it was really sad that it had to take magic johnson getting it 
for the perception change because before Magic got it, there were a bunch of, um, you know, in this case, heterosexual people getting it, but, you know, people didn't care about that. And it wasn't but, a blood transfusion. It wasn't, wasn't a, anything like that. It was yeah, just, it wasn't a blood transfusion. It wasn't anything like that. So, so yeah, you... So he he he's doing the workouts, the, the the workouts with Pat Riley to get his knee back up. And in real life, that does happen when he was coming back from an HIV uh, diagnosis and to playing the All Star game. Um, Paul West said, I've, "I've always thought they've always made him seem like a uh, an uneasy, a uh, not timid, a paranoid. People are out to get him type. You know, yeah. You know, he he, he comes off of like they're trying to give him imposter syndrome." Yeah. But I don't think Paul Wesson had imposter syndrome. I just think he just didn't like certain people tell him what to do. You know, like there were there were rules to everyone thought Paul Wesson was a I don't I want to say the I don't want to say the word because it's very harsh, but it starts with a B. And I think a Pat Riley thought that. I, I I think Jack Jack McKinney literally says that in season one, where he's like, the reason I picked you. Is because I knew you lacked ambition. I right. knew you were you weren't a threat. I knew you would never come for my job. I expected loyalty out of you, but guess what? You surprised me. You, I, I picked you because I. Thought I think you that was were, set out of anger, but yeah, okay. yeah, probably. But but you know, but I think because I also think Paul West has always had ambition. He had ambition at LaSalle. He wanted to be the head coach. He was the head coach of LaSalle basketball. He just didn't have the players to do it, so they fired him. He wanted to be a head coach. So that lack of ambition, it was like he has the ambition. Thing is, he just never felt like he 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 thought there was a right way to do basketball. You become the yeah. head, you're, you're the assistant coach. You follow the head coach, and that's it. You do nothing else. You're my right hand man. You know you do nothing else, and that's what he did with Jackie. That's what he expected for Pat. Same thing with like I have a system. I have a way of basketball. I want to play this way of basketball. I don't want Skywalker Thompson. Because he's going to be ball dominant. He wants the ball. But yep. the system is the star. And when you have a system with Norm Nixon where it's like, boom, ball, dribble, dribble, pass, 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 run to your spots. The spots are the stars. He wanted a system. Yep. The system was going to make stars. You, you know what I mean? So, But he, he was like, I don't want David Thompson because he's going to get take the ball and we have, I have to change again. Yeah, he's but gonna slash. He's, he's gonna slash to the net. He's not gonna yeah. stay. In, he's not gonna stay in the spot. He's always yeah. gonna slash to the net. He's a he's a dunker. Yeah, not even Walker Thompson dunker. for a reason. Yep. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, and that's what I like about so uh, season episode two. I'm um, let's go with MVPs. It's Norm Mixon. Stevon Nixon as Norm Mixon. I think it is. You know, uh, I I yeah, I, I think it's great. And that scene in the uh, uh, in the hallway when he gives the. Uh, the reporter, the quote, mm -hmm. or whatever. In uh, 15 years, no one will know my Magic Jordan. I think that lived up well. I think that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that really. Uh, I think that really stood the test of time. Um, I think Michael Cooper was great. I love the uh, the scene. Uh, the I want uh, you to hug. Yeah. Hug. Yeah, just him. Like, do you want to win? Do you want to win? Uh, it worked for a game. It worked for one game, but. Uh, we could talk. Let's go. Let's go towards uh, the end of the uh, the end of the episode. Oh, maybe we should also say Jack McKinney wins a uh, coach of the year, coach in the Pacers. So, yeah. Yes, yes. But there's also a, a Jerry a Jerry bust a bust storyline where Jeannie is talk is is talking business and business and business. We want business, and mm. Johnny falls in love with one of the tennis players, and she's like, "What the hell are you doing?" Yep. She's an asset. I don't care. You want to get your your kicks off? Don't be trying to mess with our money. I don't care. Like and like, Jeannie just straight cut Johnny's head off. Yep. Just cut his head off, and I'm like, damn, damn. And she's right. Yeah. She, you know, she's an asset. What the hell are you doing? Telling her to sit out, sit out during a season where I need her to make money. Like, what are you, what are, what are you doing around here? And she gets angry, yo. And I, I, I completely understand where Jeannie's coming from. Yeah. As Jeannie well as Jeannie yeah. is the hero of the show so far, if you yeah. ask me. As well the as hero. Jerry Buss is obsessed with a, a girl he used to date named Honey. Mm -hmm. So he's just obsessed with her. Then he finally meets up with her. Yeah. Well, yeah. He was uh, with her uh, quite some, uh, 
quite some time ago. Now she's mm -hmm. a, a, a looks like a preschool teacher or something. Yeah, like something that. like that. He wants to re maybe relive some of the old times or whatever. But I think he was also feeling nostalgic for his mom. Uh, they had the uh, the uh, uh, re the one year remembrance for his mother. After that, uh, he he was talking to her because I guess she was a uh, a cocktailer over at the Playboy Club. Uh, she, mm -hmm. she tells her that she's one of the only ones that actually knew her. Um, I think he respects that. So I think, yeah, maybe feeling a little uh, uh, lovesick for his mom, misses his mom. So uh, wants something, somebody there or whatever that he, he can uh, help, uh, uh, you know, ease his pain a little bit, um, which is fine, which is good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a couple of years. So we're going to talk uh, more about uh, Dr. Buss's personal life, I think. Uh, also, too, Rob, there's a little tidbit that I think that it kind of it kind of was flushed away is. Paul Wesson agrees to the trade. Briefly. He agrees to the trade for a bit. The trade is agreed on. It's agreed until, on. Until. Until what happens, Rob? Magic Johnson has found out about the trade, and he's all for it. Now, uh, as soon as Westhead hears that Magic Johnson is excited for this trade, he vetoes it because he can't have players – running the team it has to be the coach mm -hmm. and again this is another system that will stand the test of time in the nba where <laughs> the coaches are players. always in charge players uh, have no power um we're well, gonna, not anymore well we're gonna see what happens because the episode's I'm about, about there. An, i'm talking about in real life in real I'm life not about, anymore. I'm, I'm gonna talk about what's gonna happen in the next episode mm -hmm. uh if you don't know uh yeah it's it, it should be a, a very interesting episode i i can't wait for it but let's just talk about game three uh lakers come through they win game two game three and the lakers are down they haven't played well they're down i would believe it was 87 86 mm -hmm. and a timeout is called they have the ball with 15 seconds left the play is drawn up there's kareem is option one and I believe, uh, uh, is it Norm that's option two? I believe so. Magic with the ball in his hand as the point guard, as he should be. Riley takes him aside and says, no. Option two is uh, Silk, Jamal oh, sorry. Wilk. Jam that's Silk. Jamal Wilk. And third was fine. Cooper with the, with, the, with the lob. Okay. So he says to him. Shout out to Jamal Wilkes, by the way. Jamal Wilkes, <laughs> Hall of Famer. Should we point that out? Shout yeah. to Jamal Wilkes. <laughs> UCLA legend Jamal Wilkes. So shout oh. out to him. Yeah, I well, think like, it, like, yeah, as like, far as as far as UCLA legends go on that Lakers team, I think there's a there's a like, he's, he's, shadow he's, on him. But well, he's he's second because it's it's Cap and him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, overall UCLA people in 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 Lakers lore, it's it's him, Gail Goodrich, and then Jamal Wilkes. Yeah. You know what I mean? So shout out to Jamal Wilkes. <laughs> so yeah, so you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. you always see him in the locker room and stuff like that too, but. Pat Riley pulls him aside and says, no, you're the man. You're the man. And so that's all that Magic needs, a little ego feeding. And this is it. Magic's going to take this ball to the hoop, pull up, and win the game. Uh, except for that it's an air ball and they lose. Yep. To, to a team that finished below 500. Two uh, games. Yeah. The Lakers but makes are, it, but makes it to the NBA they, Finals. Though they make the finals, yeah, they make the finals. Let's not spoil. Let's not spoil who the champions are. Oh no, no. Following the show, uh, I think you might have an idea. Bosses, uh, guys, it's the Boston Celtics. They win. That's their first championship under uh, under Bird. So mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, we see uh, the selfishness and uh, and magic there. It's going to continue, guys. Uh, this next episode is should be fascinating. It's a mm -hmm. it's a hell of an off season for the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, well, yeah. Rob, speaking about that, Rob, like they go through a lot of time in these two episodes, mm -hmm. like was, a full year. Went through a season, a full entire year in two episodes. So, you think by the end of the season we're at we're at nineteen eighty four? We're, that's what it's we're supposed to end. It's supposed to end with that uh, with that title with that mm -hmm. uh, series final. Um, now, 
do, I think we're going to spend this entire next episode just in the 1981 offseason. There's so much you. happening. Because, because, so much happening. because in real life, I don't know if we should spoil it. Mm-mm. Should we? No. Okay. No. All right. Then don't. Okay. We're not going to talk about it. We'll, we're not, we'll we're talk, not talking we, about history. We can talk about it next week. Yeah, we'll talk about it next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, man, this all is gonna be it's gonna be crazy, man. Uh, yeah. what's gonna happen? Because the th- the thing that Rob, I think we kind of skipped over it was the airplane scene. Yeah, the airplane scene where where the reporter tells him tells Paul Westhead about the secret workouts with Pat Riley, and he flips out, and they're cussing each other out in the in like not in the bathroom, but like some. Thing behind it in the gal in the galley in the galley, and they and Norm Nixon overhears that Magic Johnson wanted him traded for David Thompson, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Really, bro? Man, flip you, man!" And everything Michael Cooper did to repair it. Shout out to Michael Cooper, man. Shout out to Michael Cooper, man, being the peacemaker, being the repair man. It completely dies, just like that, just vanishes. And like what? I said, Paul West said, there's one way to do basketball. He where he says, you're my assistant. Why are you, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Why didn't you tell me? You know, like you, he, he, he says, you held that on me. He's like, oh, but he needed confidence. He's like, he needed his flipping coach. I'm his coach. You're the assistant. You are not me. This is my job. And it shows the conflict that that, that is preceding him. It's gonna be a big blowhead. Some something's gonna happen between them that I'm I'm really I'm really loving to see. Yeah, the next episode is gonna be fascinating. Yeah, and then he and then they're yelling at each other and they say Magic Johnson has no right to interfere with a trade, and then and then Pat Riley's accusing him of his pride, you know, and Pat Riley says yeah. out loud, you know what, Johnson's right. You know, if we had Thompson on this team instead of Norman, we would be champions. We will be resting for round two. And Norman's hearing this. He's like, oh, what the hell did I do? <laughs> like, Well, he was also the one. Like, Yeah, Norm Nixon had no problem throwing magic under the bus, too. It's, it's just a strained relationship. There's only one ball in basketball. And somebody has to have it in mm-hmm. their hands. And they play the same position. Uh, and uh, and Norm Nixon's at an all-star level and having to be behind a rookie and stuff like that is uh, yeah. Magic's like, yo, take. man, it's that that ain't how I feel. And then Nixon's like, hey, man, what the flip, bro? Really? Like, come on, man. We hooked it out the locker room, dude. Like, what's <laughs> what's up with this? You wanted me traded? Like, what's up with that? Mm-hmm. Like, that's not cool, man. That's not cool. That's not cool, bro. So, like, yeah, there is that, man, and. I'm loving how they do conflict, man. I'm loving it. Like, not everything is like a massive, like, ah, it's, you know, like, like, like that, like, really, man? Yeah. Now there's conflict. And Norm just walks away. And Magic, you know, in Magic, being Magic, he didn't want conflict. He wanted people not to hate him. So he tried to, like, massage it with Norm. And Norm's like, nah, mi- get out of here, man. Miss me with your nonsense, bro. Yeah. Whatever. It's yeah. a relationship that will never be mended, not in a million years. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think they're friends now? Uh, how many friends do you think Magic Johnson still has from basketball? One, two, two, two. Maybe. One's Larry yeah. and one's Michael. <laughs> yeah, not even you know. I think uh, James was, Worthy was in. The, well, maybe in the first in the first uh, Byron, Byron, oh, Byron the first ep- the first episode there he's watching a, a college game in a. I believe they're you see a young Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, you do. It is, yeah, it is. It is Isaiah Thomas. Mm-hmm. They're now friends again, but you know, I don't want I don't know why we didn't want to be friends with Isaiah Thomas. The man's a scumbag. <sighs> Ruined the Toronto Raptors for years and years and years and years. Uh also New York Knickerbockers. So there mm-hmm. you go. I don't want to talk about it because <laughs> he did, what he did with New York is is uh is a crime and Ooh. it was settled. And it was so bad that the 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 uh, the owner's employee, David Stern, who works for the owners, came out and said, "James Dolan, he's an imbecile. He's a moron. Imagine insulting. Imagine publicly insulting your boss. Yeah. And and the, and your other bosses say you're correct, and everyone agrees with you. And that boss can't get you fired, because if he does, 
he still couldn't do it because he needed 29 other people to agree. Yeah, I think the 29 yeah. other guys would say, eh, hold on. I think this guy makes us enough money that you should shut your goddamn mouth, yeah. Nolan. But Rob, before we head out, we're almost yeah. one hour, I yeah. want to talk about when uh, when Jerry Rice brings up the Thompson trade and he's smiling. And he's like, hey, guys, I got this trade. It was his first time. He, it was the, it was the yeah. first trade as an exec. He's like, guys, I got a trade. Yeah. How David, excited he was! That little boy, he was, like, he was oh, a little David. boy. But like, but like, imagine, imagine, like, oh, David Thompson's up for grabs. All we need to do is give him Norm Nixon. Why is we only getting Norm Nixon? What's the catch? Catch. <laughs> no idea. That's the catch. And then he didn't, he didn't, he didn't understand that that was the catch. Uh, yo, imagine him in L. Oh my God, that would have been David Thompson in L.A. Yeah, only one ball though. There's still only one ball. Exactly. But that would have been there. There, that was that three-headed monster. There was the, uh, the, the beginning of the beginnings of the people thinking about the three, uh, the three, uh, the three-star lineup and stuff like well, that. Well, the, the, the three-star lineup. lineup already already existed. Boston had bit. it. No, they no, they had just the well, they had just had, it, and they didn't know what they had in Kevin and Mikhail yet. But that's uh, true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It, then turn, it became it turns a three-headed out, monster. It, tur- it turns out working pretty well. Well, also too, it was actually it was actually more a four-headed monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they had somebody on the the, the Boston Celtics had somebody on the roster who was already an NBA champion. Yeah, he goes by the name of the great, the late great Dennis Johnson. DJ was a champion with the seven uh, the Seattle SuperSonics in 1977. He was one of the, he was the leader of that team. So he was coming to Boston with a championship pedigree, and Dennis, you know, you know Dennis Johnson. Shout out to you, man. Shout out to you. Uh, that was that was my obligatory uh, Seattle SuperSonics mention. Shout out to you. I loved seeing that uh, they were showing the replays, and you saw the the green and yellow and white uh, SuperSonics uh, jerseys there. It's like beautiful. yay, it was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but you know what else is beautiful, Rob? Oh, our partnership on these reviews. Oh, so Rob, where can people find you, my man? You can find me. Where's the thing say? You can find right me right there. At starting eleven. And LGRN, the highlights, uh, the Premier League season uh, back up and running. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, on our episode this week, talking about you, match match week one in the Premier League. And, uh, uh, you know, more bullshit from VAR and stuff like that. And I think that dominated a lot of the conversation. I wish it wouldn't. I hate talking about referees, but it's English Premier League. So it seems like you constantly have to. Uh, other than that, uh, if you're a patron to Let's Get Ready Network, I just finished doing a five things we love about uh, Indiana Jones review with uh, our buddy Justin and a great patron, Brennan Marr. That should be coming out very soon as well. Uh, I don't know There's lots of stuff happening here. On well, the speaking of Patreon Network. request videos, we actually had one just release. Uh, me and Justin talk about soap operas. Yeah, we talked about And uh, we embarrassed ourselves uh, i made it very clear that i've never i know the names i just don't know what happens um <laughs> it was a patreon request video like i said guys if you want to if you want those videos those videos are are specifically for patrons and the patrons for them like if we get one view on those videos we're good because those videos are tailored to that specific patron and for them so that video was for brandy brandy's a 15 dollar patron with the top five indiana jones moments that was tailored to brennan that's his that was his video that's what we do, man. We 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 make those videos. You get your request once a month, time permitting. We try to finish it within the month. Uh, we appreciate uh, their patience with us, and we we really love and appreciate you guys' support. If there's a thousand of you, we'll fit a thousand in. It doesn't matter. We'll yeah. figure out a way. And if you do want to join the Patreon, join the Patreon at patreoncom underscore network. So that's right. So there's that. So appreciate everybody so much. My name is Ferris Blonde. You can find me. Here every Friday, 8 o'clock Pacific, the open table. This week, our special guests are Andre Gallego and his lovely fiance, Jen Kemp, which I actually know Jen Kemp more, so let me flip that. Our our, wow. friend, our best guests uh, this coming Friday are Jen Kemp and her fiance, Andres Gallego. Shout out to you, Jen. I love you, girl. Um, you're my homie. Um, so we're going to be talking to them. Uh, it's our weekly dinner party where we invite people. We talk about fancy schmancy stuff. I probably drink from a chalice. I look cool. I wear a suit. We have nice music in the background, as well as 3 o'clock Pacific on our Highlights YouTube channel, the sister channel, our sports channel, Good Friends, Better Routes, where we talk American football, Mm -hmm. uh, Cowboys, Cowboys, Giants, and a little NFC East. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful night. Stay safe. We'll see you all next time.